Good evening, and thank you all for joining us. This evening, we will be providing a complete update on our federal, state, and local efforts. This will include the latest on Georgia, Rhode Island, and the latest attack on all of us in Newport Beach. We are joined by Mac Hatto, Senior Fellow on Public Policy for the AKA. The Q&A is open, and Mac, I will now turn it over to you. Uh, thank you, Ryan, and thanks to everyone for joining us, uh, both directly here and then through the live stream uh, on YouTube. And, and I, uh, I think that this is a great opportunity for us to share some information that is being used right now effectively to counter some of the attacks on Kratom. And I think it's it's almost like, a, you know, we're drinking from a fire hose sometimes and we it's valuable to stop and actually talk about what the what's happening and why it's happening and what its implications are. Sometimes that gets glossed over uh, as we go forward. Before we get into the legislative updates, I wanted to provide an update on our Hall of Fame nominations. And as everyone knows, when we announced them uh, last week, uh, the there were a couple that's, uh, of names that should have been on that list that slipped through the cracks for a variety of reasons. One is that there are many of our uh, advocates who were using just standard email, and we had tried to filter all of the nominations through one. And so we just missed some because they came in in other email addresses and uh, we weren't really able to capture all of them. But uh, we're this is a dynamic work in progress. Some of the ones that I wanted to reference to you that we have added are obviously deserving people, and you will recognize it uh, when you hear their names, and they should have appropriately been a part of the discussion as we went forward. And as an example, uh, we we overlooked adding Kelly Devine, who through her from the very start, particularly focused veteran was a huge benefit DEA uh, Federal Register notice at the behest of the FDA. So that was absolutely uh, terrific, the, the work that she did. And Angela Watson and Travis Lowen, who were heavily involved with the Botanical Education Alliance, uh, obviously were great advocates and made a significant difference uh, going forward. Uh, and at the time, Vernon Jones, uh, who was uh, very active in Georgia, but also in surrounding states as he fought uh, to make sure that we kept Kratom uh, legal as best we could. And, and he certainly uh, deserves the recognition. And on the uh, the uh, the congressional people, uh, there's one person that it was pointed out to me, and I absolutely agree with this, is that Jared Paulus, who, who was a member of Congress in 2016, uh, now the governor of Colorado. But uniquely, he not only signed the letter along with 51 other members, 50 other members of the House of Representatives, but he actually took it on himself without anyone prompting him to with, I think it was, uh, uh, there was another member, I can't remember, maybe it was Morgan, Morgan Griffith from Virginia, uh, to, to call out the FDA for their position. But he was a true champion at the time and certainly uh, deserves and should have been uh, recognized. Uh, on the vendor side, uh, we obviously should have recognized uh, Kelly Dunn, uh, who was uh, from the very start uh, was was working on this issue, both in trying to recruit the attention of some of the scientists in the field. But he was the one that funded the Leap of Faith movie that was on Netflix and Chris Bell and all the people that were involved in that. Uh, but Kelly was the driving force behind that. Uh, and then, of course, we have uh, Jordan Richard, uh, who in California, who has been a great advocate. Uh, he's a vendor as well now, but he was out there pushing hard from the very start. So uh, as I say, this is a continuing effort that we will uh, add more people as we go forward to our legacy Hall of Fame, uh, but hopefully we're, we're close to rounding out that list. So if you've got any uh, individuals that you think should be added, uh, we're now reaching out to each of the honorees, asking them for a brief bio and a picture so we can put them up on a website uh, so that we recognize people appropriately. But if we're able to uh, uh, to help us with any additional nominations that are in the context of early 2016. Uh, th there obviously are lots more advocates that we are going to recognize in our ongoing Hall of Fame, but these are the legacy Hall of Fame members that uh, that we recognized. And so we appreciate everyone uh, for supporting us on that effort. So 
Uh, let's go to uh, a couple of hot spots that we're obviously working on. Uh, and let's start with the state of Georgia. Uh, this is this is a fascinating uh, exercise that we've been going through now for two years uh, in the Georgia legislature, because at the outset, we were willing to work and develop a compromise with Representative Townsend, who uh, had promoted a ban bill. And we were able to show clearly, without any question, that it was inappropriate for a ban and it was unsupportable on the evidence that he had been influenced by a group of trial lawyers who obviously wanted to get a ban on Kratom so they could go into court, and this was their motivation, they could go into court and tell the judge or a jury, look, even the state of Georgia thought this was a terrible thing. The FDA hates it, thinks it's dangerous, and now we've got the state of Georgia who banned it, and it was going to be a talking point in front of those uh, juries and judges. And that's that's simply a bastardization of the judicial system. And certainly the legislature should not be used as a tool in order to provide a, a some sort of a, a weapon that the trial attorneys can use. But that's what they were doing. And un unfortunately, they duped Representative Townsend into thinking that, in fact, that was the, the right approach to take. So through a course of numerous and hours and hours of negotiations, we came to a bill that was a compromise, and I emphasize compromise because there was many there were many parts of that bill that we didn't like at the time. But once you reach a compromise and everyone agrees to it, then the last thing that should happen is that people alter the compromise. And that's exactly what happened this year when we were involved with the Senate Health Committee in the Georgia legislature. And I told the chairman and the committee that we supported the bill, but we needed to see some changes that had been put into the bill that had not have been agreed to uh, in terms of the criminalization of retailers and processors that over criminalized them and that would create a chilling effect on anyone either manufacturing or selling Kratom if those uh, and thereby impact access uh, by consumers to Kratom products. And that I told the committee we didn't like that. There was a backdoor negotiation that was conducted by Representative Townsend with the trial attorneys in tow, and they misrepresented, and I'm emphasizing that, misrepresented to the committee, to the committee chairman, uh, and to the chairman of the Rules Committee, that the AK supported that bill. It was not true. We, in fact, opposed it. And when they convened the actual hearing, Representative Townsend came out of the back room, immediately went to the podium, and, and tried to tell this committee that we were supportive of it, and we were denied the right to testify because the chairman of the health, Senate Health Committee thought we'd already had the opportunity, and he was under the misimpression that we, in fact, supported the bill. We do not. So we are now in a, a war uh, on that bill, HB 181, which, if it's passed, will have horrible criminal penalties that are disproportionate to any a plant product like Kratom that doesn't have the safety profile that the, the trial attorneys and that Representative Townsend unfortunately has been duped into believing that it does. And it is the kind of, of criminal penalty that's reserved for uh, drugs that are actually on the controlled substances list or that are regulated at a level uh, that, that requires them to be constrained uh, in the sale. A, a good example are cough medications that are so dangerous that they have to be sold from behind the counter and they're limited in the number of, of products that you can buy in any time period. That's the kind of criminalization. And, and this particular uh, section of the HB 181 is even has harsher penalties than even those kinds of uh, restrictions on retailers for it. So uh, we are launching a as strong a battle as we can. It is currently in the Senate Rules Committee. Uh, they've got one more day where they can send it out to the floor of the Senate. We have been told they're going to do so and that it will pass. And then it goes over back over to the House because of these amendments that were added uh, by the, uh, the Senate Health Committee uh, on the belief that we supported them. And we're going to go back and try to defeat this bill or, or amend it back to its original form uh, in, the, in the House. Uh, I think at this point, given the uh, disingenuous position of the parties that have been been representing misrepresenting AKA's support for this bill, that it's time that that bill go down and that we we start over again next year in the Georgia legislature. That is our goal, and that we want to continue to do that. Now, some people have said to me, "Well, you know, it, it was it, it's close enough. You know, what do we care about these penalties? And if someone sells, if someone is in a retailer sells 
a minor more than three times, they should end up with a felony. Uh, that's an issue for the Judiciary Committee, not the Health Committee. And if it had gone to the Judiciary Committee, I think we would have gotten a much clearer evaluation of what the penalties ought to be, because what they don't consider is the chilling effect that it has in the marketing of these products and unfairly imposing a penalty on convenience stores and, and health food stores that are selling Kratom products. And that restricts the availability of Kratom products to consumers. They're treating it as though it's a controlled substance, which it is not. We shouldn't be relitigating that, that battle. So we're asking everyone to reach out through the house and, and the, the convenience store owners and the health food store owners and, and the, uh, uh, the constituents, consumers of Kratom need to reach out and respond using the tools that we're making available to everyone to communicate with the Georgia legislature that this is a bad bill and it either needs to be amended or it needs to be defeated and we'll start over again next session. Everyone needs to engage in this as best you can in order to help us to defeat this terrible legislation. Uh, the second uh, report that I can give you is uh, in the state of, of Rhode Island. I hope everyone takes the opportunity to listen to the testimony of what, what transpired in the Rhode Island House Corporations Committee. It was a, a great day for the, the Kratom community because they got to hear not only the update on the science, and this is extremely important. We know that the, uh, the Food and Drug Administration refused to appear before a federal judge in a case that they initiated against a Kratom importer for that importer falsely labeling Kratom raw materials that were coming into the United States. That Kratom importer pled guilty to that charge. The issue was, in the context of sentencing, whether or not the FDA could sustain the argument that Kratom is dangerous or not because the judge wanted to know what the severity of the sentence would be up to the agreed upon time that was in the sentencing memorandum. And interestingly, the federal government came in and said, oh, your honor, uh, you need to give him the maximum amount of time and stick it to him because Kratom is dangerous. And the judge said, well, wait a minute, in the initial indictment, which the FDA initiated and conspired with the Department of Justice to file this indictment, you said that it's sold uh, across the country. And you didn't even mention that there was a danger that was associated with it. And then he picked up on the evidence that was presented during the trial uh, leading up to the, the plea of, of guilty to the smuggling charge. Uh, he said, it's my understanding that the petitioner, the defendant in this case, prior to being indicted, had been caught by the FDA importing Kratom raw materials using a false designation for what that material was and that that individual applied to the FDA to have that Kratom raw material released to, the, to him so that he could distribute it to his customers who would make Kratom products. And the judge said, it seems to me that the FDA granted his petition. He paid a $50,000 fine plus storage costs. If it is that dangerous, why would the FDA have allowed that, that uh, importer to then acquire the raw materials, which they claim are dangerous, and sell it for the obvious purpose to manufacturers who would make it into consumer products? Great question. And so the, the, the government didn't provide a decent answer to that. And that's when the FDA communicated to the court that they were refusing to participate in the what's called a Brady hearing, an evidentiary hearing on whether Kratom is dangerous or not. And they, the FDA refused to participate on the basis that they, the FDA, have not yet determined that Kratom is dangerous or not. Now, that was sent in December of 2023 for a hearing that was supposed to take place on February the 8th, 2024. The FDA admits that they can't go under oath in a federal courtroom on a case that they initiated based on the fact that Kratom was dangerous and testify under oath that Kratom is, in fact, dangerous. That's an important, it's an important point in, we now know that the entire effort by the FDA was built on a, a pile of sand. There's no foundation for it. The, all of the information which we've suspected and pointed out the various discrepancies in the claims by the FDA since 2016 have now been exposed for exactly what they are, which is a, a complete and utter lie about whether or not Kratom is dangerous or not. The FDA has now admitted it. Now, they, they obviously carved out the space to say, well, we might have additional information in the future, but 
you know, it's we can't we can't testify currently whether Kratom is dangerous. And then, as I think I hope all of you know and that you should know, is that in February, the deputy commissioner of the FDA appeared on a webinar with the Alliance for a Stronger FDA. And she started in response to a question about what is the regulatory policy of the FDA about CBD and Kratom. And this deputy commissioner pronounced that the FDA is very interested in working with the Congress to acquire new statutory authorities in order to properly regulate CBD and Kratom. She pointed out specifically with Kratom that they wanted to, the FDA wants to make sure that it's manufactured properly wants to make certain that it is labeled appropriately and wants to make sure it doesn't get in the hands of kids. Now, what does that sound like? That sounds like the Kratom Consumer Protection Act. There is nothing that would stop the FDA from doing exactly that right now, except that they have this voracious appetite for having additional statutory authorities that they would expand their regulatory reach beyond what Kratom, these new statutory authorities would give them and CBD, they wanna use them for other things. So it's just a, a power grab. But they, the deputy commissioner acknowledged what, in fact, Commissioner Caleb said a year before when testifying before the House Appropriations Committee and in response to a question from uh, Congressman Pocan about Kratom. It was, commissioner Caleb said, look, I need a couple more months. This was a year ago, year and a half ago now. I need a couple more months. And then I'll tell you what I need, these new statutory authorities ought to be. And it's been silence from the FDA until last month when the deputy commissioner restated the position of the FDA. Now, if, if the FDA wants to make sure that the products are manufactured properly, wants to make certain that they're labeled appropriately, and wants to make sure they're not in the hands of kids, then that tells you that the FDA knows the Kratom is safe. They know it. And yet they've been telling people, and if you go on their website today, FDA and Kratom, it says you shouldn't use it because it poses a danger to the American public. And the truth is, if you look at their 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 uh, pledges that they made in the Federal Register, which is an official declaration, which requires them to be truthful, they under factor six of the eight factors said that Kratom poses an imminent threat to the American public. You don't see anywhere on the FDA website or anywhere in the Federal Register where the FDA has said, whoops, we were wrong. We want to amend that statement. That false statement sits there today as though it is a fact, and it is not and even the FDA recommends it. But then, and this is the coup de grace, then the FDA appears at the third annual Kratom Symposium, International Kratom Symposium in Florida last month. And an FDA official presented uh, the results of the dose finding study. This is a safety study that is designed to allow the FDA to determine that Kratom can be safely administered to human subjects so that they can conduct a broad-based human abuse potential study, a HAP study. But they can't do that unless they can show that human subjects can safely consume Kratom. Now, what they wanted and hope to do, and it's obvious when you look at all of the data that surrounds this, the FDA does what's called a single, a single ascending dose study, start out at one gram and they kept ratcheting it up. 40 human participants, eight of which were placebo people, so that they didn't know what they were, they weren't actually getting the Kratom product. And they, they got up to 12 grams, which means 24 capsules, half milligram, uh, cap, 500 milligram capsules, uh, in a five minute period. They found two of the 40 that experienced an adverse event in the form of nausea. 24 capsules, 12 grams of Kratom in a five minute period. That's an astounding dose of Kratom to consume that quickly. And these are people that for the last 30 days have not had any substances that they're consuming, including Kratom. So they, they their body would have cleaned out of any of the reactions they might have. So there wouldn't be uh, the kind of situation where you just had built up your tolerance to a dose level. Uh, these people were Kratom clean for 30 days prior to that study. And this is a typical protocol that they use when they do, do, do these kinds of safety studies. Now, here's what our critics are saying. They're saying, oh, well, the FDA hasn't really published the data on that study yet. This is just conjecture. They come close to calling us liars because they say that the FDA really hasn't done anything officially. Well, I have in my possession the slide deck that is branded as a Food and Drug Administration document that was used by the FDA official 
at the symposia in Florida. It's a public document and it's branded as a Food and Drug Administration document. Now, is it true that they haven't published all of the specific data? Uh, they have not yet. They're planning on publishing that data and presenting it at a conference uh, either mid-year or the end of the year. But that has nothing to do with what the top line results were, which are that, and they characterized it, that the Kratom appears to be well tolerated at all dose levels. Now, that's different than saying Kratom poses an imminent threat to the safety of the American people, because that's what they said in the Federal Register Notice under Factor 6 of the eight factors that they're required to submit to, to justify a Schedule 1 recommendation. That ship has sailed. And I don't care what these trial attorneys want to scramble and say, oh, the, the FDA really hasn't published the data. That's just their self-preservation for the argument that they're trying to make in courts that Kratom is dangerous. That is a house of cards that has collapsed, and they can no longer say that. Now, do, do people consume Kratom and, and, and abuse it? Yes. Uh, do people consume other products, other drug products, while they're consuming Kratom? Some for good reason, by the way, because Kratom is helping them, but others because they're consuming all kinds of substances because they have addictive personalities. Yes, that happens. Does that mean that Kratom is the cause of death? The answer to that is no. There's no science that shows that. We know that there is no uh, dose level at which Kratom can be identified as being toxic where it would cause a death. We know that. Now, you can do it for other substances. You can find out exactly what it is. We know what, what how much oxycodone you can take and you will induce a death in a human. We know that. What we don't know is what's happening with the FDA or with the, the Kratom uh, the, the toxic level. So here's the bottom line. Is the FDA in the business of producing accurate, reliable information for the American public, or is it in the business of propaganda? And clearly with Kratom, they're self-justifying the, the war that they created on Kratom, and they started uh, actually back in the early 2000s, and it culminated in 2009 when they found their holy grail, the nine deaths in a 12-month period attributed to Kratom. They know, they, the FDA, know that a study that was done by Swedish researchers and published in a peer review article, which means it's readily available to the FDA, and it was, it was published in 2011, where the conclusion was that those deaths were actually attributed to a toxic dose level of O-desmethyltramadol. That's the, the chemical that produces the opioid tramadol. This is what the FDA is doing. And yet they, they get away with it. And if you look at the complaint after complaint after complaint by these trial lawyers, they say the FDA says, and then fill in the blank for the various statements the FDA has made over time about, the, about Kratom, and they say it's dangerous. And some of them even cite the nine deaths in Sweden. They cite the 33 deaths that the FDA claims were caused by Kratom, the 44 deaths of Kratom associated by Kratom. Now, we all know, we all know what how that was evaluated by independent people, not, not the AKA uh, and not the FDA. We know that when Dr. Jawa evaluated the claims made by the FDA, he characterized that document, those eight factors that they had submitted as embarrassingly poor evidence and data. That should have been the canary in the coal, coal mine saying it's time to abandon this cave, right? They should have done it. The FDA should have said, hey, we need to rethink this, but they didn't, they doubled down. And then they went to the uh, UN Commission on Narcotic Drugs, lower standard for scheduling, tried to get it ske Kratom scheduled internationally, but they ran into a buzzsaw at the Expert Committee on Drug Dependence. 12 independent experts from that are uh, obviously work and have enormously uh, uh, good credentials in substance abuse and addiction, and they unanimously, unanimously said insufficient evidence to schedule Kratom. They also said 11 to 1 that even 7-hydroxymetrogenine, which we all agree is potentially a problem, depending on you know whether it's artificially uh, juiced up in a Kratom product, uh, 11 to 1 they said that there wasn't sufficient evidence to schedule. So here we are, after a decade-long disinformation campaign initiated by the FDA, and now we're finding that it, it's all collapsing around them, and they're not even honest enough, honest enough to just say, we made a mistake. This is something that they could easily correct. They could join us in working to find the right regulatory scheme. They could do what the deputy commissioner said, what Commissioner Califf himself said, let's find and talk about what the appropriate regulatory structure would be. And we may find agreement 
we may be able to to allow for Kratom to be sold in the United States and lift this goofy import alert, which is nothing more, nothing more than an abuse of their regulatory authority in order to create a de facto ban on Kratom, because as everyone knows, most Kratom raw materials uh, comes from Southeast Asia. Now that's changing, but for now, we're relying for the most part on those those uh, substances and, and I, th those raw materials. And I can tell you that the Indonesian government and the Indonesian farmer cooperatives are working hard to make certain that the supply chain contamination vulnerabilities are are fixed, and they're making doing everything they can to make sure that you get you get pure kratom that's unadulterated and non-contaminated. And the commitment that the government has made, if the FDA would listen, because they've formally submitted an application for it, they said that they would not only require all of these processors in in Indonesia to meet these exacting standards to make sure that kratom was clean and compliant with the wholesomeness required by the FDA, they committed to do it and they guaranteed that they would have a government laboratory that would test uh, the raw materials so that you couldn't have any gaming of the system by the farmers. That's an astounding commitment uh, from a country that is willing to, to do the right thing in order to move the, the needle on this issue. The FDA didn't say no to them and they didn't say yes, they said nothing. They received this application from the chief of staff to the president of Indonesia back in September of 2023. And here we are more than six months later, silence. What in the world is going on at the FDA for that to happen? Now, all of you heard that uh, description, uh, at least a part of it, uh, at the Rhode Island hearing. But then you heard uh, a, a, an expert, uh, a, a chemical analyst that talked about another important part of these discussions about the toxicity of Kratom. And he said, and, and it was important to listen to it, and you ought to go back and hear him out. He said that there are so many novel substances which are not detectable by the traditional drug screens that are run by medical examiners and coroners. We don't even know what the actual cause of death in many of these cases are, even when it's attributed to something else other than Kratom. But we know for certain that it's wrong for a medical examiner uh, to actually claim that Kratom was the cause of death when there's no scientific data or quantitative data to support that. Uh, and that's important. And, and that and I'll add one other thing, and I referenced this in the Rhode Island hearing. Uh, a couple of years ago, I received a call from a mother whose son in the state of Ohio, and I think all of you have, have heard this story or parts of it and seen her testify. Her name is Jane Richardson. And Jane was distraught because the, the, uh, the medical examiner's team had come to the uh, the scene where her son had passed away, and they had observed that there was a bag of kratom on his nightstand, and there on that the basis of that alone, the investigator was prepared to call this a kratom death and told the mother, and she said, "No, no, my son was saved by kratom. Five years ago, he was an addict, and he was headed to an overdose, and kratom he found kratom, and it has saved him for five years." And she told them about other medical conditions that her son was confronting at the time that likely was the cause of his death. But the medical examiner, hearing the pleas of this mother, said, OK, I'm just an investigator. I'm going to I'm going to let the coroner make this decision uh, and, and we'll have the talk screen back in eight to 12 weeks. So you'll hear back from us after that. The mother was obviously still concerned. The next day at 10 a.m. in the morning, the coroner calls her personally and said, I have sufficient evidence to determine that this is a Kratom overdose death. He had no talk screen data. He had no medical autopsy report. He had only a bag of Kratom sitting on the nightstand, and he was ready to put his reputation on the line, saying this was a metrogenine intoxication death. Uh, the mother said, what can I do? And we offered to cooperate with her and funded a lawsuit to challenge what was obviously an egregious miscarriage of justice in this case. This mother wanted to know why her son died. She wanted a legitimate evaluation to be done of it. And she wanted Kratom that had saved his life not to be the boogeyman for this medical examiner coroner's office that was just trying to take the easy way out. And why did they do it? You know, that's the question. So the lawsuit was designed to extract that kind of data with the remedy being that the coroner, or the, in this case, the coroner would, would uh, remove the designation or cause of death 
and replace it with an accurate uh, kind of designation. And so about uh, two weeks ago, a little, little less than two weeks ago, the coroner decided that based on a review of current literature on Kratom and based on the overall context of the investigation, that he is now determined to change the cause of death from metrogeny intoxication to undetermined. And his explanation says that based on this review of new literature and a review of the case overall, that he fi finds that that change is justified. That's a magnificent change for a mother, but it has enormous consequences for us because how many medical examiners and coroners today have done the very same thing that this Ohio coroner did based on inaccurate, incomplete, and, and obviously uh, incorrect information uh, leapt to the judgment because it was popular to do it because it was the determination of the FDA that Kratom is dangerous. And now with that gone, we're hoping that there will be a review by many of these medical examiners, not only for past cases, but a word of caution, the flare is up, that if a medical examiner wants to make a conclusion based on that same inaccurate information where no quantitative data exists that would lead anyone to a determination of the Kratom being a cause of death for anyone, then they, they need to be more cautious and reserved about leaping to that judgment just because the FDA wants them to do it. Uh, so th we think this is a great stride forward. Uh, you're going to hear a lot more about this. I know that the uh, the 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 trial attorneys are are you know mystified by what all of this happening. They can't explain why the FDA is doing what they're doing. They can't explain why this erosion of the uh, of all of the information that they've been using, the inaccurate information they've been using to justify these lawsuits. Uh, and you know the, the significant part is we want as as a consuming public. We want to make sure that every Kratom product that is available for sale is safe. We want to make certain that it's been manufactured properly, that it is appropriately tested, that the, that the labeling is correct and robust, and we want to make sure it's not available to kids. Uh, those are appropriate restrictions on Kratom, but this idea that we can ban it and we you know they keep doing the silliness and go after vendors because guess what you can't do? You can't go out if if you have a loved one who's been struggling with addiction problems. The, the last person you can go to to file suit against and get any kind of a recovery from is the drug dealer on the street or a, a counterfeiter of a legitimate product that has spiked their product because you can't find these people. They disappear as fast as lawsuits are filed. But what they can do is sue legitimate creative manufacturers and make a claim that those manufacturers didn't do the right thing. Now, all of that is going to be played out in court where it should be. Uh, all of that is going to be tested, but I think there's going to be less of an appetite going forward for trial attorneys to use a favorite tactic, which is to force a settlement, wherein it's less expensive for the manufacturer to fight them in the lawsuit than it is to settle. And I think the trial attorneys as a strategy rely upon that. And I'm hoping that these vendors will say, you know what? Uh, enough's enough, and we're going to now fight back, and we're going to make them for you know, prove their case. And you see, the evidence that's now available would certainly contest any complaint uh, that's made that says the kratom is a cause of death per se, because it's just kratom, and because the FDA says kratom is dangerous, and the medical examiner says kratom is a cause of death. Those things are going to be contested now. Uh, I had an interesting conversation with a medical examiner today, and. He cited the fact that the Tampa Bay Times article had said that there were 46 deaths in the state of Florida that were Kratom only. And I told him, I said, you know, uh, all they did was report what the medical examiners said. We've been working for the past four months to try to replicate the so-called hand-built database that the Tampa Bay Times claims that they built because there is no information stream. There's no reliable data that you can say, okay, I'm just going to call this up and see if what they claim is true or not. And the, what we, we've been unable to replicate what the Tampa Bay Times has done, even though we've devoted a significant amount of time to it. So that's one question that still has to be answered by the Tampa Bay Times as to how their hand-built, and they, that's the way they described it, database led them to that conclusion. But I made the offer to them on behalf of the American Kratom Association that if they would take those 46 deaths and they would get the blood specimen that's available and then send it out for a full talk screen 
So you don't get into a circumstance where they're only testing for a few substances or only for kratom, and you you actually subject that blood specimen to a a full a talk screen to identify uh, what Tom Griffin was talking about in Rhode Island, where you need to have a real uh, a robust evaluation of what substances were implicated in the death. And and I made that offer and said, we will pay for it. You choose the lab. And do you know what their answer was? No, they weren't going to do that. They wanted a cheap headline. They wanted the clickbait, sensationalized headline uh, in order to go forward. I also challenged them on their headline. We all remember it, the deadly dose. And they tied it to the 46 deaths. And even the reporter in a, uh, a national public radio interview that I was on uh, about 10 days ago with them, even the reporter said, well, that was a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding between the headline writer and the report, because he said, and he's right, they, they even said there's no known, the scientists haven't identified a known toxic level of kratom. So how could the headline be justified saying a deadly dose if no one knows what a deadly dose is? And this is the kind of conundrum we get into when you have unethical people that are just trying to get clickbait sensationalized headlines. And by the way, it's transparent what the Tampa Bay Times wants. They want a Pulitzer Prize. They spent $400,000, as they describe it, six months, five or six staff people working on it, most of them full time. And what else would they, why else would they do that except they want a Pulitzer Prize? But I don't think the Pulitzer Committee is in the business of rewarding sensationalized clickbait headlines that mislead people. I don't think they're in the base in the business of awarding people that are tainted in terms of the inputs into the story. Uh, all of you know that based on information we've received from trial attorneys that say that they supported not only the information stream, and we've got that with evidence, uh, they also said they supported it financially. And the best we could get from the Tampa Bay Times editor is, oh, we checked the database and we can't find any names. They don't even, I mean, they think a trial attorney is not going to be clever enough to hide the source of the funding, but the trial attorneys claim that they help fund it. And I don't think the Pulitzer Committee is in the business of taking self-funded uh, hit pieces by an interested party that has a direct conflict of interest. So that story still needs to play out. We're going to see more information on that as we go forward. But all of this is important because collectively, what's the current state of affairs right now uh, in terms of whether Kratom is dangerous? The FDA has retreated and, and left the position that they can prove that Kratom is dangerous. They no longer can maintain that. They are publicly talking about how they can regulate Kratom, not ban it, regulate it. And they are publicly disclosing the results of a, a, a human study, a safety study that said they got to 12 grams in a five minute period, 24 capsules. And the best that they could get was a, a two individuals in the study experience some nausea. That's different than the, the early claims of the FDA that at four grams, you're going to go into seizures and you're going to have significant adverse events. Those days are gone because those lies have now been exposed and we know that they're not true or not. Now, uh, I should say, and I think it's fair to say, that there are many of the scientists and researchers at the FDA who really are interested in knowing the truth. The problem is that the policy people at the FDA are the ones who are driving the issue on Kratom. And they they will not be able to say, we made a mistake. They're not likely to do that. The bureaucrats aren't built to do that. For goodness sake, look at what we went through with COVID. And all it took was for, uh, for Dr. Fauci or someone in the NIH to say, you know what, we made a mistake here. Uh, they can't bring themselves to do it. And so uh, I think that that we're gonna to continue to confront that issue. And that's why Congress has to hold them accountable. So that's just a, a, a background in terms of where we are. Uh, we, we're, we're looking forward to great success coming in Rhode Island. Uh, we're hoping, and everybody needs to help us over the next couple of days, next week to fight back. Our goal is to kill that bill in the house when it goes over there in its amended form. Uh, and if we can't kill it, to amend it so that it strips out these onerous uh, criminal penalties. We need everyone to help us there uh, because it's critically important. And then we've got some states that are coming up where we're going to be calling upon people to help us. We know that the uh, the, the Kratom danger awareness people, uh, and I have no problem talking about this because the, the leaders of the Kratom danger awareness people prove every day that they are every bit the extremist that we point them out to be. Because there are people in their group 
who openly talk about, well, let's regulate it. Let's, they're not called, they know bans are unachievable, particularly with this new science that's come out. Let's regulate it. And why wouldn't they be for that? But you know what the Craven Danger Awareness leadership says? Oh, no, we got to ban it. And the FDA, the AK is lying about this. The, the FDA never said this, or the FDA uh, didn't publish the full results. And they tell people, do not, do not give up autopsies or talk screens of, of your loved one. Don't do that because people will misrepresent what's in that. What is there to misrepresent? A quantitative analysis of what the substances are in a decedent's talk screen cannot, cannot do, say anything but what the truth is. Why not let that be public? You know, and you have many of these families and, and you know, you've got to obviously feel for them. If you lose a loved one, uh, they legitimately are grieving and they would like to believe, uh, you know, some of what they're being fed, uh, particularly by trial attorneys that are promising a payday. But they'd also like to know the truth. We want them to know the truth. And that's why we've been so uh, aggressive about fighting back on this kind of thing. Um, you know, we and I'll, and I'll encourage all of our people to do what I tell the Kratom Danger Awareness people is that we don't put up with people calling them names or 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 saying vile, vicious things about them. My pointing out their extremists is just their position. Uh, I'm sure they're they're nice people in real life. I don't know, you know any reason not to suspect that. But this is an issue where they're blinded by their grief and they're they're weaponizing it now with a level of extremism in terms of what they advocate for. Uh, because I think we're closer than they think we are with the majority of their members who think that we should regulate Kratom. We want it to be pure Kratom. We want it to be not adulterated. We want to make sure that it's labeled properly, that people know how much they should take in a serving size and how many servings per day. We think people should have warnings about the kinds of health conditions they might have that would preclude them taking Kratom until they have consulted with a physician. I think all of us want that, but that's not what you hear uh, the Kratom Danger Awareness people say. Uh, and that's really unfortunate. And, and you know, they're active. They're promoting uh, an agenda that is every bit the extremist agenda that I've talked about. Uh, it's a free country. They can do what they want. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we have to allow them to peddle disinformation. Uh, and that's why we have to be so diligent as we go forward. So we're going to continue to work towards that goal. Uh, we're going to do everything that we can in order to bring an accurate set of data to public policymakers to continue to promote the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, both at the state and federal level and at the local levels. Uh, we took a loss at Newport Beach, California. Now, we, we went out there with a fairly strong message conveyed by public policy officials that were disproportionate to that community, but we did so because we know that that community is an influencer. And what we learned was that this ban was baked. It had nothing to do with anything we were going to say. It had nothing to do with any what anyone was saying on the Craven Danger Awareness Group. It was about a, a very influential and big corporation that's involved in addiction recovery that wanted to have this, uh, this ban put into place. And that's all it was. Now, it was a mistake that was made by the, uh, the, 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 the city council. And what better evidence could there be than when it was presented, they heard evidence, not a single opposing witness. They had the former drug czar uh, at the White House tell them that the FDA was wrong. You had uh, Senator Kurt Bramble from Utah who told them that his evaluation, that the, that, that the FDA was wrong and that his experience with his constituents were how Kratom was saving their lives. Former Congressman Matt Salmon, who told them that uh, his experience in, in the legislature, in the U.S. Congress and what the determination that they made and which the DEA obviously concluded that the FDA was wrong in what they were doing. They heard they heard from influencers in public policy. And this is the most important thing. Not a single question and not a single comment. How in the world can you sit there through that kind of testimony and not have a question about what was presented except for that this was baked from the start? And so don't fall into the trap of believing that, you know, oh, well, we were able to rally the troops that you hear from the Kratom Danger Awareness. Nonsense. Because we outnumbered them with people that were influencing by significant numbers, but that didn't matter to the city council. Now we hope that they'll come back 
and they'll reconsider their vote uh, when when cooler heads have prevailed. Uh, we're going to continue to work on that, but we're uh, we're obviously uh, interested in making sure we find the truth at the local, the state, and the federal level as we go forward with uh, with all of these these battles. So um, there uh, there's the the bottom line in terms of where we are. Uh, and and I'll open up for questions now. Ryan, did I miss anything that I was supposed to cover? You did not, Mac. Uh, as always, did a perfect job. So thank you. <laughs> the Q&A is open. Uh, first question, how did you, Mac, find out that the Georgia bill was changed without your knowledge? Good catch, by the way. So when, when the discussion took place in the uh, committee staff room uh, between Mr. Uh, Representative Townsend and and the chair of the rules committee in the senate and i think the senate health chair was there uh they came to an agreement on language about the criminalization that representative townsend incorrectly said that the american Credit association was good with that was the first knowledge we had of it when it was described so i asked to testify and the chairman of the uh health committee uh senator watson said no that you've already had your your time to testify, which we had, but we didn't. He thought that we agreed with this language, so it was a uh, a terrible day for for the truth, a terrible day for good legislation. Uh, but that's how we found out about it. Thank you. And ambulance chaser Matt Weatherington tweeted that new kratom data is coming this week and is very bad news for kratom advocates. Any idea of what he may be referring to? Well, there's. There's always there's two kinds of research that you have to watch for. One is good, solid uh, research that's based on traditional uh, standards for evaluating, in this case, Kratom. Uh, there are there are going to be case reports and case reports generally involve one or two patients that are written up by a couple of clinicians. And uh, and they, there's a problem with those because they, they aren't representative and they aren't uh, subject to the same kind of rigorous standards that you would require for a peer-reviewed published article. Case reports are vastly different. I don't know what Matt Weatherington is referring to. Uh, we have a pretty good uh, idea of what uh, what research that's ongoing. Uh, but hey, the research field is open to lots of people that depending on the method that is employed and the protocols for the study, you might be able to to find information. Uh, we'll wait and see. Uh, I'll tell you one thing about Matt Weatherton. Matt Weatherton is a, a, a very fine attorney. Uh, he's smart. He's aggressive. Uh, he's willing to put his money where his mouth is and has done so, obviously. Uh, he's he is not someone who you would say uh, is is just a charlatan, uh, but he is an advocate for that side of it. So whatever information uh, that he thinks is coming down the pike and that he knows about it before everyone else does tells you a little bit about you know, maybe who instigated it. So we'll have to see. I'm, I'm open to whatever. We've seen uh, reports about Kratom that once they've been examined carefully, uh, they kind of fall apart. And we know that the FDA could not have come up with a single ascending dose study about the safety of Kratom and have it contradicted by someone within a week uh, of it being published and, and or at least revealed. So I'm, I'm not too worried about whatever Mr. Weatherington might be uh, referring to, but uh, we'll welcome it. We have always believed that science should drive policy. And, and I'll tell you what we're able to do. If we're wrong, we'll say we're wrong. I don't think that's something that some of the others involved in this discussion will do. Certainly the FDA is not willing to do it. Uh, so we'll just have to see how that plays out. Great. And a comment from Misty, uh, the FDA led their troops to battle, then bailed on them. And also from Misty, uh, what's next for Rhode Island? Well, Misty's absolutely right. I mean, think about the if you're the U.S. attorney in the Southern District of California and you brought the case against uh, Sebastian Guthrie, the importer in question here, because the FDA told you to do so and told you that Kratom was killing people and it was highly addictive. If you were the U.S. attorney and then when the judge questioned you as the U.S. attorney, how can you prove that Kratom is dangerous the way that you claim? And you then go back, the U.S. attorney goes back to the FDA and says, hey, let's go. We have to, we now have to testify under oath. And what happened? What happened? They refused to testify. I don't think 
that the, the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of California is going to be too receptive to the next case the FDA brings to them. Because why would you trust them when they bailed on you in that way? And so I think that that's one positive outcome is that they're not going to have the open door that they've had in the past to some of these U.S. attorneys. And by the way, they all talk. The U.S. attorneys are going to take this case and say, hey, look what the FDA did to us. So be careful when they come to you hat in hand saying we want you to go uh, file an indictment against, indictment against someone. And then uh, what's next for Rhode Island? So the, the the committee, the House Corporations Committee, will hold a vote on on the number of bills that they have reviewed over the past several weeks. And then when they pass out the Kratom Consumer Protection Act, and I'm confident they will. Um, and, and by the way, our, our strongest critic on that committee last year, and you saw her this year, is, uh, is a Representative McGaw, who is a pharmacist. And I thought she was much more even keeled about listening this year than she was last year, because I think that that she relied on the FDA just as much as the U.S. attorney did in the Southern District of California. And it's kind of hard to defend someone that bails out on you. Uh, you know, you're leading the, the charge up the hill and you look behind you and they're retreating with the white flag. I mean, that's it's hard to take. So I'm hopeful that uh, that we'll get it out of the, uh, the the committee. It will go to the House floor. We passed this twice on the House floor. Our challenge has always been on the Senate in uh, in Rhode Island. And and I don't think it's even about Kratom. I think it's just the politics where the interactions between the House Speaker and the Senate President, and we kind of got caught up in some of that. I think that our sponsor this year is uh, of the Kratom Consumer Protection Act is one of the leadership in the Senate. She's highly respected. Uh, she is well prepared to take the battle here. Uh, she is enthusiastic uh, for uh, getting this bill passed and allowing Rhode Island constituents to have access to Kratom that's properly regulated. So I think that uh, uh, we have an excellent chance this year of getting that ban overturned and we have the Creating Consumer Protection Act enacted in the state of Rhode Island. And I don't think approval can come from consulting a physician because they don't have that kind of training. If it's big pharmacy medicine, they do, but not much outside of that. Yeah, this is a great point. Uh, a physician, if you go and ask them, uh, they typically won't even know what Kratom is, right? And they'll Google it. And the first thing they'll see is the FDA says this, and the Mayo Clinic says this. Well, they're just, it's its an echo chamber because the Mayo Clinic has not done a lick of science on their own about Kratom. They just repeat what the FDA says. So a, you know, a, a, a physician says, oh, I, I don't want to have any parts of this. Uh, a serious look at Kratom. Uh, I had a problem with a injured knee and uh, I told the, uh, uh, the specialty uh, physician about Kratom, he knew nothing about it. And he said, you're taking Kratom? I said, yeah. And uh, and I said, I don't need your uh, pain medication. And he, he said, I don't know how in the world you walked in here without crying to me, wanting an opioid. And I said, well, because Kratom helps. And so he, he actually took a look into it, called me and said, send me some more information. And I did. And so I think he's on his path to learning more about Kratom and hopefully will become an advocate for it. But that's what it takes is, you know, on a case by case basis, physicians learning about it and seeing the results and hearing the testimonials of people that really are speaking uh, for people that create them saving their lives. And it does. There's no question about that. And then uh, from John Schenholzer, uh, what treatment center in Long Beach proposed the ban? So, uh, John, you and I could talk about that offline. I don't I don't want to end up in a lawsuit with these people, uh, but we have a pretty good idea who it was. Uh, and I'll share it with you offline. And uh, Jeff, thank you as well. And uh, from Glenn Scheip, uh, what is going on with this class action lawsuit? So uh, one of the one of the strategies by trial attorneys is to consolidate cases and they do a class action, which obviously uh, increases the pressure on the Kratom manufacturer uh, to to obviously settle. So uh, this it's a tactic, and and by the way, it's a legitimate tactic, and and sometimes it's very helpful. In this case, what it's going to take is companies that are in the the uh, business of manufacturing creating products who do it right to fight back, and and so you see a class action's been. I think there are three or four class actions. Doesn't take much 
to file the suit. They have to certify the class. That's a more complicated legal process, takes a lot of time. Uh, I think you'll see some of these cases fail on that basis. But even if the class is certified and they move forward, the real question is, is Kratom the cause of whatever the individuals who are in the class claim that it caused an adverse event, whether it was you know, the dependence or whether it was a death, they have to prove that. And I think that the the challenge that's that's now before anyone who files these lawsuits, no matter what these trial attorneys are telling their clients, they now have to prove it. And I think that the newest information that's currently available, uh, the challenges directly, the complaint that these, and I've looked at all of them that have been filed, they always go back to the FDA. They always go back to the FDA's outdated statements about the dangers of Kratom. And I think they have a much tougher uh, challenge now to prove that, given the FDA's retreating from them. I think that when it comes to court cases and they go to trial and the trial attorneys are saying, Your Honor, I'd like you to hear from the FDA representative, he's going to look there and see an empty seat because the FDA ain't in that business anymore. Uh, they really can't justify what has been said in the past. And so I think that uh, you're going to see a different dynamic at play. Not that the trial attorneys are going to retreat. They won't because they want as many people as they can. And unfortunately, I think materially misleading some people in some cases uh, who believe that Kratom uh, actually is deadly when in fact it's not. It could be an adulterated product. It could be other underlying health conditions. It could be uh, other uh, substances not yet identified. That's why you need to listen to Tom Griffin's statement uh, that are these novel psychoactive substances that are popping up in, in street drugs and in adulterated products. So we'll have to see how that plays out. Thank you. And I've seen multiple comments of people saying you can purchase Kratom in Rhode Island gas stations. How is that true? Well, I don't know the answer to that because I have not stopped at a gas station in Rhode Island. Um, I think you have to live there to do that because you you drive for 20 miles and you're out of the state. So uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm going to ask. I'm going to find out about this. Great question. And I'll, I'll ask to see if it's actually being sold there. Just a statement. It's my understanding that Israel has done testing on Kratom for many, many years. I would love to see that data. I've not seen it. And so if you've got access to it, I'd love to see it. The last couple of questions. Uh, John Schinholzer has been great for our cause. Has his testimony held sway in some of his presentations? I really get a kick out of his passion. So do I. And, and more than his passion. John Schinzholzer is a true advocate. I mean, he his passion is embedded in his soul. Uh, he, when he speaks, you know it's from the heart. And and I can't tell you when I'm in awe when I listen to him. And and I've been to hundreds and hundreds of these hearings, and he's like a rock star to me. And and I I love it when he's able to come and talk about uh, these issues. And he's a recognized expert and a leader in the addiction recovery community. And he is, he's open-minded enough for him to have allowed for him to follow the leads because you know he, he worked for an organization that founded an organization that didn't like Kratom. And here he is, uh, you know, now saying, you know what, Kratom can be a tool uh, that will help people and we ought to allow it to be available. He mirrors or re-echoes what Nora Volko at the National Institute on Drug Abuse says that Kratom is potentially a valuable harm reduction tool. And when you look at the data that shows that, that the access to a treatment facility for a person that's struggling with addictions, that either the bed is not available or it's available at a price that, that very few people can afford, therefore it is financially inaccessible, or you live in an area that's so remote that you can't get into a treatment facility, then other options need to be available. And that's a message that I know Jack Henningfield and that Nora Volko have both pushed hard uh, about realities of how we, we deal with addictions and how we ought to have harm reduc uh, reduction tools that are available. So uh, uh, there, there isn't a more powerful uh, advocate than John Schinsolzer in the addiction recovery space. And, and I'm, I, said, I said before, I'm in awe. The guy's amazing. So I know he's listening and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to send him a bill. Uh, for being such a great advocate for him, uh, but it's sincere. I, the, I love the guy, and and it was my life was blessed when he came into it, where we had a chance to start these discussions because he really is a fabulous human being. On top of being this great advocate for uh, access to 
valuable tools that people that suffer from these addictions need to have. And so we're grateful for it. That's great. And uh, what's next for Georgia? Do we need to plan on going to Congress and testify? I'll be glad to go give my story. Well, Deborah, what you need to do is uh, get on our website and our, our email train and start sending uh, messages to the uh, targeted legislators. We need you to do that. Everybody needs to do that. We desperately need that uh, so we can kill this bill or at least get it reamended over on the House side. There won't be any more uh, this session, any more uh, testimony accepted other than your calling or emailing. And those are important platforms for you to get that message across. So thank you for being willing to do it. Uh, write it down, send it to these people, and you can go uh, through our advocacy uh, network and, and be able to send it through. Great. Thank you, Mac. And just one statement, not a question. I had to educate my doctor about Kratom and now she's good with it. So thank you, Rebecca. And the final question currently, how are things going in Ohio? One thing that's true about legislative uh, bodies when they're full time, they're very deliberate and they're very slow. Uh, Ohio is an example of that. Uh, we, we have uh, we're making great progress there, uh, but it's slow because of the legislative process. So uh, we expect that in the next two months, we're going to have a hearing and we'll circulate that and we'll ask our advocates to come and testify. And when we get to that point, we'll alert you. But right now, it's just a little bit of a deliberate process. I just got an email before we went on from uh Illinois, and they had it in second reading, and they've got a couple of issues. We're still working with the regulatory agencies there, uh, but I'm I'm hopeful that we can get to make real progress in Illinois. Uh, so that's great. In Kentucky, uh, we had a little bit of a blip uh, working out an issue with uh, 70H manufacturers. Uh, and by the way, uh, our position at the American Kratom Association is that if if there is a 70H enhanced product that says it's a Kratom product, it should be illegal. Uh, the we can't speak to any other products. Uh, they have to stand on their own merit, but I'm not aware of any science that would justify a Kratom designated product, a 7-OH at levels above the 2% that we advocate for of the total overall fraction. So that's a continuing concern. Uh, we're open if there's more science and, and there's been representations that there is new science coming. Uh, so we're going to continue to to work on that issue. But right now, in Kentucky, we're we're hopeful that that bill is going to pass, and specifically say that uh, as long as it's not a that any kratom product designated as a kratom product. And a good example is this product. This says let's see, it says if you can read it, an advanced kratom alkaloids. My understanding is this company and others are going to remove the reference to kratom, but there are there are people in this uh, industry who are chasing a buck, and they'll peddle this stuff. And they won't care about the uh, levels of 7 hydroxymetrazine that are in their products that could potentially be dangerous. So I just say be cautious. But on a policy level, we're going to be making certain that they don't exceed the levels for Kratom designated 7-OH products that are above the 2% of the overall alkaloid fraction. That's great. Thank you, Mac. And uh... From Alexander, we have had to clarify for others that it is a 2% limit of total alkaloids, not 2% total tablet weight, including binders and fillers. Alexander is exactly right. And this is this is often a complex, well, it gets more and more complex, but uh, in this particular issue, it's the uh, 2% of the overall fraction of the total alkaloid content of the, of the, of the, the actual product. Uh, and so it's a very small amount. And uh, and Alexander's exactly right. And thank you for pointing that out. And and Alexander was with us in uh, uh, in in Newport Beach. And I appreciate your standing up and your testimony. We were we were the ones that are obviously uh, talking to the wall. Uh, but it was important to get on the record, and we're going to continue to pursue it. So thank you, Alexander, for being there. That's great. And uh, yeah, Mac, any closing comments? Um. Thanks to the Hall of Fame members. If you've got more that we've missed, send them to us and we'll evaluate them. Uh, stay tuned for the next round of Hall of Fame advocacy uh, uh, nominations because we want to recognize people as we go forward. Uh, we're grateful to the scientific community that continues to deliver consistently uh, great information for us to use as we evaluate 
uh, the safety of Kratom. Uh, congratulations to every advocate uh, that's out there fighting for us. I, I see you on social media. I wish I could interact more. I'm just a doggone busy, but I see it and I hear from people and we're grateful to all of you and the influencers in our community that inform yeah. other advocates. These are great things uh, that happen in our community and we're very, very grateful for it. So uh, thanks to everyone. Thank you, Mac. And thank you all for joining us this evening. We'll be in touch uh, within the next week or so. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.